Welcome back to Hard Round Box. It's been a pretty chill week here in Australia. Pretty glad we're not having to deal with the busyness that is CES over in Las Vegas. It's been nice to just catch up on the news stories during the day and work on some reviews for the coming weeks at the same time. In my last couple of videos, we've gone over a lot of the announcements from the show, new products, new releases, and all of that. In this video, we'll be finishing off the last couple of things that have been shown over the last few days, and then getting into a quickfire monitor roundup towards the end. On the news front though, let's kick this one off with Intel's discrete XE GPU DG1, which has been shown off at CES 2020 in the form of a desktop add-in card for developers. The idea here is software vendors can get their hands on one of these cards from Intel and start optimizing their software for the XE architecture, whether that's games or productivity apps, ahead of its launch in both integrated and discrete GPU products. Intel aren't talking a lot about XE discrete graphics or DG1 just yet, but the card itself does give us a few insights. It's a short dual slot card with a single fan and no PCIe power connectors. So that tells us the card is fairly low power and it consumes less than the 75 watts that can be provided through the PCIe slot. There's four DisplayPort outputs plus a shroud that's, yeah, not too bad for a development card with a bit of lighting and an interesting grille design. What we know about the GPU itself is Intel are touting its performance at a low power draw specifically, and that it's based on their XELP or XE Low Power Arc architecture. Intel apparently have three derivatives of their XE architecture for different applications with XE LP for low power devices like mobile, there's XE HP for high performance, and XE HPC for server and cloud based stuff. Looking at Intel's slide, gaming does slot in the middle of the LP and HP categories. So everything we know here. XELP architecture, less than 75 watts power draw, single fan design, points to this early development card being a low power discrete GPU likely destined for laptop form factors. It's unclear whether this would be similar in performance to Intel's XE integrated graphics, so the same sort of chip pulled out of one of their CPUs like the upcoming Tiger Lake platforms and just put into a discrete GPU package, or whether it's a high power GPU that's only achievable in a discrete design. We just don't know for sure yet and we expect Intel to talk a lot more about this in the future. However, some leaks before Intel showed off DG1 did suggest this initial discrete offering would be competing with cards like Nvidia's discrete MX150 and MX250 GPUs, so around a 25 watt TDP class, far from the sorts of high performance laptop GPUs that are available. But again, no confirmation on that and yeah, take that one with a grain of salt. Intel was showing off DG1 running Destiny 2 at 1080p low settings on the CES show floor. Some fellow YouTubers like Gamers Nexus got some hands on time and suggested the card was running at sub 60 FPS with that configuration. GN actually frame counted their demo, producing some interesting results that you can check out in their video, links in the description below, but in short, it was definitely below 60 FPS. Again, it's really hard to say anything about this performance, whether this sort of performance is impressive or not, without knowing the performance targets of the GPU itself and its power consumption, which is crucial for mobile form factors. If this was meant to be a GTX 1650 competitor or something like that, yeah, not very impressive, but sub 60 FPS performance at 1080p low settings in Destiny 2 is around the mark for a 25 watt GPU. Don't have any firm benchmarks for you, but that is similar to what you'd get with an Nvidia MX250 in this title. And the MX250 at 25 watts is around twice as fast as what Intel's integrated GPU provides in current gen iSelect CPUs. Of course, if this isn't a 25 watt part, that wouldn't be that impressive, but it's just so hard to come up with a firm conclusion based on such limited information. But those are, yeah, just my thoughts on where this demo is at right now. Another interesting Intel-related story coming out of CES is courtesy of Computerbase. They've managed to speak to several motherboard vendors at the show, and the picture isn't looking great for Intel's upcoming Comet Lake S series, and in particular, the new 10-core model that we are expecting. According to this article, new products with a new Z490 chipset are ready to go for Comet Lake S and the 10-core part. However, the motherboard makers stated that the 10-core part is running into power consumption issues, which might be why Intel are holding back on the launch. Perhaps they're trying to get power consumption as under control as they can possibly get it uh, before unleashing a 10 core part that does up to 4.9 gigahertz all core according to some leaked documents. The article says that several motherboard manufacturers have claimed the 10 core part consumes over 300 watts of power under full load. Now this is a lot higher than the supposed 125 watt TDP we'll see for this chip, but yeah, that's the crappy TDP rating for you. It should be noted that the chip is expected to have a 
3.7 gigahertz base, which should be more achievable within that TDP. It's just when hitting 4.9 gigahertz all core that it sounds like 300 watts is on the cards. And with many motherboard vendors implementing unlimited duration PL2 power states out of the box, keeping the CPU at its all core turbo indefinitely, that's when you get those consistently huge power draws. Now, this isn't a promising sign for Intel's upcoming 10 core part. The Core i9 9900KS already consumes more power than the Ryzen 9 3950X under full load with its 5 GHz all core frequency across 8 cores. Yet in multi core workloads, the 9900KS is significantly slower than the 16 core 3950X thanks to AMD's use of the highly efficient 7 nanometer node from TSMC, while of course Intel is stuck on 14 nanometer. If Intel is needing to add an extra 2 cores into the mix, still on 14 nanometer, which likely won't make the 10 900K reach the 3950X's performance, it sounds like they'll be blowing sensible power consumption figures out of the window to do so. This will mean system builds will require even beefier coolers than is already needed for the 9900K for more heat output and, of course, potentially louder designs. Now, this is all just a rumor at this stage, but nothing here is particularly unusual. If Intel are targeting 10 cores, so two extra cores, at 4.9 GHz all core, then we will see higher power consumption than the 9900K like this computer-based story suggests. As for whether the 10 core will be worth buying in the end, that'll come down to how well it performs up against Ryzen parts like the 3950X and 3900X, as well as its price. It doesn't necessarily need to match those parts in terms of performance, the price just needs to be competitive. Will Intel price it below $500? Who knows, but we should find out more about this CPU closer to its launch date, which we believe is around April. Micron has begun sampling DDR5 registered DIMMs to partners, which means a couple of things. Firstly, DDR5 is nearly ready, and secondly, there are some server platforms in the wild that support DDR5 right now. These would likely be engineering samples for upcoming platforms like Intel's Sapphire Rapids, which leaked roadmaps suggested would support DDR5 with a 10 nanometer CPU starting in 2020. 2021. To get that platform out the door in 2021, of course, Intel would need working DDR5 DIMMs to test with throughout this year in the development phase. Micron has shown some data on how they expect DDR5 to perform. When matching transfer rates between DDR5 and DDR4 at 3200 speeds, DDR5 provides 36% more bandwidth, but DDR5 also supports higher transfer rates overall, up to 6400 megatransfers per second, although Micron's comparison with just DDR5 48 showed an 87% increase to bandwidth. That's pretty significant and will greatly assist next-gen platforms that will continue to push up CPU core counts and will want a handy boost to memory capabilities over limited memory channels. The DDR5 spec also allows for a few other benefits like lower power consumption from a lower supply voltage and support for DRAM chip densities above 16 gigabit. So this will be a substantial upgrade to memory for future platforms. When will we see DDR5 in consumer designs? Well, if Micron is sampling now and we aren't expecting server platforms to use DDR5 until 2021 at the earliest, it could still be a few years until consumer platforms start implementing it. Generally for these sorts of technologies, server platforms lead by a couple of years until the cost for implementing and using DDR5 drops enough to make it a sensible choice for most cost conscious consumer stuff. We might even see the return of dual support platforms that allow for both DDR5 and DDR4. Samsung's upcoming 980 Pro SSD has been spotted at CES 2020 to the excitement of storage enthusiasts. This is Samsung's first consumer PCIe 4.0 SSD with rated performance at up to 6500 megabytes per second read and 5000 megabytes per second write for sequential tasks. It'll be available in 250 and 500 gigabyte capacities as well as a one terabyte model, of course with NVMe. And Antec notes this sort of performance is better than other current generation PCIe 4.0 SSD although competition could tighten up towards the end of the year as new controllers hit the market. And Nantech also speculate based on the capacities that this drive is using MLC NAND rather than TLC. Expect more information in Q2 2020. Corsair has returned to the world of air coolers with their new A500, a dual fan tower cooler designed for the beefiest CPUs out there. It has a quad direct contact copper heat pipe design and uses two of Corsair's ML120 maglev fans operating at 400 to 2400 RPM. It supports cooling CPUs up to a 250 watt TDP, which you would expect from such a big boy cooler. One of the downsides here is it doesn't support the latest STRX4 socket for Threadripper 3000, nor does it support TR4 for that matter, 
possibly because the contact area isn't large enough for the huge Threadripper chips, but it does support all the other main platforms. Neat to see Corsair back in the air cooler game. Their AIOs have been decent for a while now, so it'll be interesting to see how this beast competes up against the giants in the air cooling business, particularly from Noctua. There have been a few interesting laptop announcements at CES, but this to me is the most interesting. It's the Asus Swift 3, not the most flashy laptop. It's more a mid-range device, but what it will provide is the first true comparison between Intel's Ice Lake and AMD's Zen 2 APUs, because the laptop is available in either configuration. On the Ice Lake side, you'll be able to get up to a Core i7 1065G7, and on the Ryzen side, up to a Ryzen 7 4700U. That's paired with up to 16 gigabytes of LPDDR for x memory and 5 to gigabytes of storage. However, the starting configurations, which are at this point unknown in terms of specs, are also interesting. The base AMD model is cheaper at just $599 compared to the Intel model at $699. The Intel variant will be available first though in March with the Ryzen model coming in May. Hopefully we can get both in for an excellent apples to apples comparison. All right, let's quickly round out this episode with some talk of the monitors that have been shown off at CES 2020. Many of these new products won't be available for several months. I actually wouldn't be surprised to see them again in an unreleased state at Computex later this year, but let's quickly summarize them if you're interested. The Samsung Odyssey G9 is a 5120 by 1440 32.9 ultra wide monitor with an impressive 240 Hz refresh rate and a 1000 R curvature. In other words, it's very curved, perhaps too curved, but the refresh rate is impressive for a VA monitor. It's basically a double wide 27 inch 1440p monitor and it includes VASA's Display HDR1000 certification. There are also G7 models available. 32 inch 4K HDR monitors are coming to the market soon as well with the Acer Predator X32 and the ASUS ROG Swift PG32 UQX. Both are 4K IPS panels with a 144Hz refresh rate, G-Sync Ultimate and Display HDR 1400 certification making them some of the brightest monitors on the market market for HDR. That's thanks to a 1152 local dimming zone backlight, 89.5% REC 2020 coverage, An Asus model is listed at 3600 US dollars and will be released in the second quarter of this year. Cooler Master monitors are also on the way and include products such as the GM34, a $750 34-inch 1440p ultrawide with a 144Hz refresh rate and FreeSync 2 HDR support. Cooler Master initially showed off some of these monitors at Computex last year, but it seems they are closer to production now with this particular model available this month. A few other monitors will also be coming. MSI also getting in on the 1000R curved bandwagon with the MAG342 CQR, which is similar to the previous MPG341 CQR in that it's a 3440 by 1440 panel at 34 inches with a 144Hz refresh rate. This model is just more curved and it's expected to be available in either Q2 or Q3, so probably we'll see this again at Computex. Lots of brands are coming out with alternatives to the LG 38GL950G. MSI have one, it's the MEG381 CQR, and it takes the 3840x1600 24.10 panel up to 144Hz, similar to the LG 38WN95C. Nixius have a new 4K monitor coming to market at 27 inches in size with IPS technology and a 144Hz refresh rate. It uses display stream compression to hit that refresh rate without issues. It'll be available in Q1, no price just yet, but I'm expecting good value given that's what Nixius are known for. There's probably a few other monitors that I've missed, but surely that's enough monitors for one video. It's back to usual programming after this. More benchmark content is on the way, and we're hoping to have reviews of some of the stuff AMD has announced in the next couple of weeks, like the Radeon RX 5600 XT, so subscribe for that. As always, you can support us through the usual channels like Patreon and the merch store. Links to that are in the description below. That's more than enough news for one week. I'll catch you in the next one.